is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dark, Season 2, Episode 6, An Endless Cycle. In this episode, I fucking knew Adam couldn't be trusted. I don't like any of this. I'm... What's going on, Jonas? How could you change this much? Is that really Jonas? What happened? Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Natasha. First of all, thank you, Nikolai, for commissioning this episode and apologies to Nikolai for having to schedule this at kind of a random time. Um, but I'm attempting to see when in the day Crowdcast gives me the least grief. So I usually get through about a half hour before things start to go weird. And we're going to do the most we can with that half hour and hope that it just continues on to be uneventful. Um, so this episode is bonkers. This is probably the biggest reveal, in my opinion, of the show so far. I just feel like, I mean, there's been lots of moments of just like no shit throughout the show because of the nature of it. But I think that this episode outstrips them all in terms of being just a shock of like, okay, so... I had said when Jonas, when old, older Jonas interrupts younger Jonas before he is about to go and save Mikkel, I had said, maybe you shouldn't exist. Maybe you should just like let yourself be erased from the narrative here. If that means returning this poor kid to his family, if you existing is dependent on on the trauma of someone else and the, you know, misplacement of someone in time. And also their family is suffering deeply and being fractured by this. Maybe you should sacrifice yourself. And like, I'm not trying to say this would be such an easy thing to do. I'm not trying to say even that in the moment I would have been able to be like, well, I'm very dispassionate and this is the logical choice and I will definitely sacrifice. I'm not saying that, but I felt like it was worth the thought. There's just a sort of like out of hand. No, you can't because then you won't exist. And I really wanted Jonas to interrogate that a little bit and just be like, and? And then what? You know? Um, so when Adam presents this idea and was like, if you take yourself out of the equation, things won't happen this way. I asked myself at the time, how would it actually be different, right? Because he's saying, stop your father from committing suicide and that will stop the whole chain reaction. And I was thinking back and I said at the like time that I recorded that episode, would it really? Is that the start of everything? Because we don't, I didn't know at the time who took Mikkel I mean, there is like this, this odd moment there when he disappears, where it just feels like he disappeared into thin air. So part of me was just sort of like, I don't know that I agree with that assessment. But I didn't exactly think that Adam was just straight up lying. I thought that Adam was like, I thought that Adam was just operating from a mistaken perspective that he was positing a theory that we as viewers weren't really supposed to question that this was, you know, okay, so let's just say this is the moment that things begin and have him try and go back and change that one moment. And that will be what we go like, what we pick up and run with. And as much as I just was kind of like, I don't really see how that works. It did not occur to me that Adam was 
doing the opposite, essentially, that Adam was just like, oh, no, I'm going to make sure everything happens exactly the way that it had, but lie to you about the fact that this is going to prevent everything. So this reassures me a lot, because when I didn't love the theory that just stopping his dad from killing himself was going to fix everything, essentially. I was willing to suspend my disbelief because I was like, I guess if the show wants us to think this, okay, I don't really see it, but I guess. And now that it's been proven that the show is no fool and they are not really believing this, I have a little bit more confidence. I feel like they are smart enough about how they've done things that I should have probably had more trust in them to begin with. Um, But it does make me trust Jonas a bit less because, again, I don't entirely understand why Jonas bought that as the as the moment of being able to derail the entire cycle. Like I said, you don't know who brought Mikkel into the cave. And if you don't know that there is no guarantee that other stuff that somebody isn't going to make that happen anyway. There's this sort of like, cause I was thinking back and like, while well, they wouldn't have been in the woods to go take Eric's stash. If Eric hadn't died and he was killed by Noah. So if none of that occurred, then I guess they wouldn't be in the woods. But after I like stopped recording, I was like, well, somebody guided Mikkel there though. There is nothing to say they couldn't find Mikkel somewhere else and make him go into that cave anyway. Them being in the woods was circumstantial, but that is not necessarily the linking moment. There is somebody out there like that we're acting as if Mikkel disappeared from the woods like into thin air because he just happened to be like near the caves, forgetting somebody had to have taken him. That is a person with an objective. And there is no reason to believe that that person is going to be out of the equation. I guess I had started to assume that it was Noah because Noah has been just hovering around the cave entrance so much now, but I'm realizing that like, Noah comes and visits Mikkel in the hospital and Mikkel doesn't seem to recognize him at all. So that can't have been who it was. And we find out at the end of the episode that it was Jonas that led him there. And I just, guys, as right before when he's like, well, who took you? And his father looks at him and I was like, oh, he don't say you, don't say you, don't say you. And he says you. And I'm like, no, oh, what, what? Because you see this moment when his father in the past sees him take his uh, raincoat off the hook and he drops something like there's a real fucking trigger response there. And I, all I could think was like, oh, fuck. No, just I'm not thinking that I'm not thinking that it was Jonas. I'm not doing it. And I got forced to think it and I hated it. So, all right, I've gotten way ahead of myself here. Let's begin actually talking about the episode. So we begin with the usual and I say usual because a lot of episodes begin this way. Where did this begin in the past, in the future? And we see photos of all of the families that are involved here. Um. I really like some subtle things that this show does here and there with the making somebody feel like they are apart from things. Like, for example, in the photo with Jonas and his father and mother and uh, Inez, I guess, who is his grandmother, kind of adopted grandmother. um, Everybody is smiling and looking at the camera, except for Mikkel, who is looking off to the side and isn't smiling. There's like this sort of distracted look about him. And it's just a small thing, but it feels like he isn't there. It feels like everybody is experiencing a thing and he in his brain is totally somewhere else. Um, And a similar thing happens later when we go to the lake and everybody is chilling and swimming and having this beautiful like summer and Jonas 
is separate, sitting on the shore, dressed, watching everybody. He is not in the water experiencing things with them. And there is just this theme throughout a lot of this show of people feeling isolated and like they don't fit, you know, and it's not necessarily that they've traveled. It just seems like that's part of their, their destiny. It's just like, I'm just not going to fit because I have a whole other thing that I'm going to wind up being involved in. And from the beginning, I just never quite felt like I fit, you know? So we start, um, after we get like kind of flashbacks to everything else that's going on, we have Jonas and, uh, he is getting his cereal and there's something about the consistency of the show, having a see Jonas at the fridge, getting milk so often that I'm starting to really like, I don't think it's like that meaningful. I don't feel like there's like a secret, you know, like metaphor behind it necessarily. It's just, this is the first thing he does in the morning. We all tend to have our routines and I just love getting to see every different stage of Jonas doing the same thing, you know, like it's just no matter what else changes in his life, no matter which version of him this is, sometimes we just fall into the same patterns, especially when we're in a house that's familiar, you know. Um, so his father is here and I got puzzled at first because the way that Jonas wakes up and looks around, I thought that this was somehow past Jonas waking up in his own bed. And I was like, wait, okay, I don't actually know how that machine works. Is he able to do that? Is he able to like go where he wants and just be in the bed? But no, this is proper past Jonas, which we see pretty quickly once we see him interacting with his father. There is no artifice here. This is a Jonas that hasn't got the baggage that the present Jonas we know has. Um, I want to say too, that this episode goes to before we have met everybody at the beginning of the show. The very first episode, his father has already killed himself. We're seeing everybody like with the fallout of that already. I am impressed, but beyond measure with how this show manages to make everybody look just that bit younger, right? His father killed himself by the time we start episode one. What is it supposed to be like three months earlier, two months earlier? I feel like it's it hasn't been a very long time. But there is something about everyone this episode that feels lighter, that feels younger in a way that isn't just appearance. It's there's just less gravity to things. People haven't gone through the loss and uncertainty that they have by the time we reach, you know, the uh, middle of season one. And this Jonas eating his cereal just feels so much more lighthearted. He is just a kid waking up about to go to hang out at the beach with his friends on a gorgeous summer day. Good mood, looking forward to things. His father seems like you know, he is in a pretty decent place, all things considered. And most shocking of all to me, Hannah comes down the stairs and really affectionately like wraps her arms around her husband and kisses the side of his head. And there is, I expected if we ever saw her and Mikkel together, that it would be this incredibly awkward, like, I married you because I kind of felt like I didn't have many options. And now I sort of resent it. I thought there would be this real feeling of resentment threaded through all of their interactions. And instead, it just really does seem like she loves him in her way. It's not, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that Obviously, she's still in love with Ulrich. You can tell immediately when you see the two of them together. You can tell Ulrich can tell. I mean, he's not an idiot. Um, but I just thought there would be more animosity. I thought that there would be something about Mikkel knowing that she's having an affair 
And and that's my misunderstanding because when I first started watching this, I thought she was already involved in the affair. And we find out later it hasn't begun yet. Um, once I realized and I saw the two of them together, her and Ulrich, and I realized that they weren't having an affair, my next leap to conclusions was, oh, I bet she starts having an affair once her husband kills himself and that she didn't want to cheat on him. But once she was single, it felt like, why not? And I was wrong about that, too. Um, so we get kind of like the groundwork here that's being laid down because we need to see the two of them, Ulrich and Hannah, not quite getting what they wish they could from their spouses. And the it's really frustrating. Like in terms of Mikkel, Hannah, he doesn't want to go to the party this evening. And of course, we fucking know why. I mean, of course he doesn't want to. I mean... Yeah. And she says something about, don't you think you should go out? Can't you try for me? So this puts a different spin on things than anything that we have really known. We knew that his father became an artist, but I didn't really know that he was as reclusive. And I have said a few times that like, if this were to happen to me, I don't feel like I would stay in the same town. I feel like I'd move away because I don't want to be around my younger self like it would just be it would be too awful and be around my parents who don't know who I am like go somewhere else there is a real sense to this show though that Wyndon is an enclosed microcosm like this is some sort of closed system that people can't leave and I don't mean that in terms of like a there's no like force that's like an external force that's keeping them there there's something like about the knot that's tied in that community that holds people there emotionally. Um, So he has chosen to stay in the community, but just not engage with the community. And I guess that's the next best thing if you aren't going to move away. So Hannah clearly is a little bit Like when she's asking him to come out with her, she has her arms wrapped around him. It's a really evocative shot to me because we have Mikkel in front and I'm going to keep calling him Mikkel, even though he's Michael in that in, you know, as an adult, we have him looking up at at something in the distance, remembering stiff as a board, not engaging with her. And she is behind him with her arms like wrapped up around him from behind. And there's something about her doing that and having her like head over his shoulder that really feels desperate and grasping. And you can see how much like she genuinely has affection for him and she wants him to come out with her. She wants him to participate She wants him to engage with the world and with her. And as somebody who was in a marriage where my partner felt like a completely, like I was lonely within this marriage, I kind of understand her being so hurt here, you know, and he can't explain it. Of course, there's no way to tell her. So she goes to the party alone. There's a real feeling of her being sad about it and Ulrich we see with Katharina and he's trying to have sex with her and she has all the reasons to not have sex she's got a ton to do there's a party tonight she's really tired she hasn't shaved she's about to get her period all of these things to put him off right Uh, some of them may be true some of them may be an excuse regardless she doesn't want to have sex and it's pretty clear Ulrich is just the kind of dude that he does not understand the responsibilities that Katharina says that she that she has like Ulrich is we've seen multiple times out fucking around while she takes care of their family and it's 
really easy to just be like, well, she's not having sex. Well, he's going to get it somewhere. What did you expect? And it's like, well, first of all, you don't expect him to just go fuck anybody. But second of all, for him to like leave his family behind and leave all the responsibilities in her lap as he's having an affair is particularly gross and a particularly like mannish thing to do because men just have a lot less commitment to domestic responsibilities and they have a lot less respect for that kind of work. So her very valid to me waking up on the morning of about to have an enormous party and being like, no, I have shit to do, dude. I can't right now. I get that. And he clearly doesn't think of this as stuff that he also has to do. This is stuff she has to do. And he's annoyed that it's eating into his fuck time. And it's like, well, maybe how about you like get the fuck up and do this too? How about you also engage with the party that, you know, you are throwing allegedly? Just saying. So later on, when he is hooking up with Hannah outside in the rain in a scene that I'm just like, simultaneously, it's hot. But also, what are you doing? You know, um, she is in bed. Katharina is curled up against her sick son. I mean, you know, she missed half the party in order to comfort this kid. And her fucking husband is out here fucking somebody in the yard behind the shed. I mean, it's so gross. Ulrich, why are you like this, dude? And Hannah, too. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to excuse Hannah. We know that she's been in love with him for so long. And I think that is part of why I have a little bit more sympathy for her in this moment. Because for her, this is a huge, I have been in love with you for literally like 25 years, right? I am, I mean, longer because this is their 25th anniversary. So 30 years minimum. And you are finally reciprocating. So it seems she doesn't get that. That's not what this is for Ulrich. She is somebody carrying a torch. He is looking to get fucked and he knows that she cares about him and he knows that he can take advantage of her. So he does. And it's just this incredibly selfish thing. So while Hannah is not innocent in this at all, she's still cheating on her spouse. She's still fucking a married man. I have a lot more sympathy for her position in all this, you know, and Ulrich is just so incredibly flat out selfish. And so like, in my mind, conniving. You watch him sort of like pick her out and decide that he's going to pursue this throughout the episode. And he initiates the flirting when they're in the yard in a way that is meant to evoke their, you know, original meeting and being friends kind of moment. This, I know how long you've been carrying this torch and I'm going to specifically remind you and re like and encourage you by saying that I remember too. And it meant something to me when it really didn't. It didn't. Let's be honest, it didn't, you know? So anyway, I just found it interesting because throughout this episode, not knowing exactly what's happened yet, I just made assumption after assumption over, about the order of things and how they happened. And I kept being proven wrong and I kept being surprised. And then once you like get a little bit more detail, you're kind of like, oh, Okay, yeah, no, I guess that makes sense. But it's just hard to watch in its way because people are behaving in these ways that are a, a bit of a preview, but things haven't gone quite left enough or you know that this is going to change between them and that things are going to sour and it's just hard. It's a, eh, eh, you know, um, so we let's talk about the lake scene because um, Jonas, Magnus, Bartas, and uh, Marta all head to the lake. It's a real like, <coughs> excuse me. There's something about Bartas that makes me really sad. And this episode, I mean. It's hard it's hard to say this and feel like it's not 
something to be sneered at a little bit because Bartas is, is a very like privileged kid. I mean, within this community, his family is the most wealthy. Um, he's definitely kind of like a bit spoiled, but there's also something about him that feels separate and it's emphasized this episode with the party at Ulrich and Katarina's where we see him at this dinner party that his parents are throwing for their employees that he can't get out of. It's one of those moments that I really just want to know, why did his parents want him there? I thought it was a business dinner. Maybe I misunderstood that. Um, but essentially the whole town is at, Ulrich and Katarina's house, except for him and his family. And there has been a sense of them being separate from the beginning of the show, mostly because Regina has been so separate. She has this hotel that we see her in at the, the in the first season, straight up alone. Like she's standing in what feels like a completely empty building most of the time. Um, his father we know is not from here and has this like huge secret their connection with the nuclear power plant makes them feel a bit separate as well because we know know that everything sort of originates from the disaster that happened there that's being covered up he has nothing to do with that directly but there's a just a sort of thread and him attempting to flirt with marth with marta i keep wanting to call her martha but it's marta really um, man, but that is an awkward moment. Like it is really cute. And I actually thought that he acted that scene pretty well. He is desperately trying to like, it's not even really trying to flirt. He's just trying to pay her a compliment and he can't even really like quite do it. And She's obviously so into Jonas that it takes her a minute to even realize like, oh, I think he kind of likes me. But it like it, she eventually catches on clearly because it's very obvious. But she, it just how I, fe I felt for Bartas in how much he likes her, obviously, and how not a, a factor he is in her mind. It just takes a second for her to even catch up to something that's like pretty obvious because all she can see is Jonas. And there's something sort of sweet about that to me in its way, because I, I feel like Bartos is empirically more attractive than Jonas. Like if you were to just look at them side by side in a photo, but Jonas definitely has something and he's got this chemistry with her and the fact that the one that's kind of like technically hotter and has like a rich family is just so not really interesting to her. It's a nice like subversion of what a lot of people would assume would draw someone to a partner. And I just kind of like, I I'm like, how many other girls are there in town? Because she's like the lone girl hanging out in this group of guys. Eventually we do see, Francesca, is that how you say her name? Um, topless swimming with, uh, and she's like floating in this real, like sort of creepy dead way. And poor Magnus rush rushes into the water because he thinks that she's hurt, maybe drowned, maybe dead. And she stands up and is like, I'm fine. What? And he just freaks out and runs away in a kind of an adorable moment. And we, this is the, the genesis of him being attracted to her. It's kind of funny too, when she stands up and she's topless, you would really think that this would make him kind of go, Oh, Hey, what's up? But instead he's like, Oh God, Oh God, Oh God, Oh God, Oh God. And he just like fucking sprints away. And I sort of respect the fact that that was his reaction. There's no, like, there's no, I'm seeing this as an invitation. There's no, I'm going to take this opportunity to check you out. It's, I shouldn't be here. I just made a fool of myself. My God, I'm embarrassed. And uh, I kind of like that. So anyway, Jonas and, and Marta is a relationship that I have felt the show wants me to care about more than I did. And 
I feel like this flashback helped with that a little bit. I didn't, I, I liked the two of them together. I liked their being like, they're constantly thinking about each other. It wasn't like I had a problem with that, but I just didn't, you know, the first time that we see them all together, the very first time Jonas is coming back to school from having been gone and seeing that she is now with Bartos and it just left a sour taste in my mouth mouth to see all of their like fucked up relationship at this point. And the fact that Jonas sort of had this assumption that she was just going to sit there and wait for him. I didn't love the implications of what was happening in their introduction. Now that I see the way that they were together, it makes a little bit more sense because it like, uh, obviously what is between them is pretty intense. So him thinking that she is going to sit and wait for him, it feels less like him being just territorial and entitled and more like, wow, I felt a really strong thing. And I assumed you also did. And now I'm realizing maybe not. And that really sucks. And it gives me a, a bit of a kinder look at Jonas. Um, so yeah, she comes out of the water and it's just this like really great, this great scene between the two of them where they don't really talk about much. She's saying something about how like, I feel like there are things happening. Do you ever feel that way? It's a very sort of like, I mean, as a teen, if somebody said this to me, I would just be like, I don't know what to say. Things are always happening. Like, what do you mean? Um, but I liked more than what they're talking about, the body language between the two of them. She is obviously so drawn to him. He is very into her, but much more shy and not as confident that she feels the same way as she is about him. And overall, the chemistry really was there for me. You know, he gets up and leaves. And this is when we see our Jonas, who... For a second, I was a little bit puzzled at him being here. And then I realized Jonas fucking knows that he is about to not exist anymore. This is essentially him saying goodbye to Marta. And, you know, for Marta, he won't exist. It's not like she'll miss him. It won't be like he died. She will never have known him. So probably it'll be fine. But Jonas, for him, it's like he's about to die. And he walks up to her and this scene really, I kind of felt a way about it because I was like, dude, do you not know? Like, <laughs> so this was my first inkling that maybe Adam was lying to him and it's a real tenuous thing, but I'm going to explain. <sighs> He comes up to her, sits beside her, tells her they are perfect for each other and she should never doubt that. And then they kiss for the first time for Marta, obviously for Jonas, not so. And my immediate thought was Jonas in the present, for him, it's going to be the first time he kissed Marta later. But to her, they've already done this. So he's going to have this trepidation she no longer has because to her, they've done this already. Which for me, I was kind of like, man, you're kind of throwing your, your present self under the bus a little bit because he's going to be a little confused. She's going to be talking to him about this like romantic heart to heart moment y'all had and he isn't going to know anything about it. And as soon as I thought that, I was like, unless that happened. And then I started to be like, Oh, no. Think, Jonas. Did she, the first time you kissed, say something to you about this? And that was my first. If he is interfering here and said, you and I are perfect for one another, never doubt that. And then we saw in her dream him say that to her, which we did. This conversation did already happen, which means he's not changing anything. 
And that was my first like, oh, no, Adam fucking lied. And he's been sent back because that's part of what happened. That's going to like, and I still didn't get the thing with the suicide because I was like, well, if he interrupts that or if he stops him, that's still, but this was, this was the first clue that things, the mission that he had been sent on wasn't the mission that he had been told that he wasn't actually making a change. And I just started to get this like sense of dread from here on out. Um, so there's a really moving scene. Um, Ulrich and Katharina come over to borrow a bunch of glassware and whatnot for the party. And you see Ulrich just kind of look at Hannah in this way. And you're just like, mm -hmm. he's starting to put feelers out and he's looking at her and trying to see if she's looking back and if she's smiling and the vibe she's giving off. And God help me, but Ulrich is sexy, man. He just is, though. So, like, it's effective. He fucking knows he's effective. That's what's so annoying, you know? Like, ugh, hate dudes like this. Ugh. Um, so, <laughs> this is when poor Mikkel with Rubella goes into the house to use the bathroom. And older Mikkel does this thing, which is just because we know what's going on. I get it. But if you were not aware what's happening here, you would assume that he was like a child molester, right? Cause he's going up to the door and listening to the kid use the bathroom through the door and then creepily like stands there and like hides behind the door as Mikkel comes out of the bathroom and just stares at him. And he's like breathing hard in this creepy way that could easily be seen as just like pervert breath. But we know what's actually happening. And it's just so tragic. <laughs> like, you know, he's looking at himself a couple days before his self loses everything. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. So... Mikkel turns around and spots him and is just freaked out because you think, yeah, uh-huh, you would be and runs outside. And I have to imagine that he remembers this moment. And I wonder what he as a kid thought was going on here because it's really like it's a freaky moment. Um, So. There's also a brief moment with Alexander and he is looking at this newspaper and it says something about this uh, murder that's happened like what at this point, like 33 years ago, I think the newspaper said, and that it says they are still in pursuit of the two perpetrators. So he gets on the phone with somebody named Wal Waller. Um, and he had seen this uh, this headline at home and his wife could sense something was wrong. But it's not until he goes to work that he calls this guy up. <coughs> um, and he is sweating when he calls the guy. Like he's obviously kind of still thinking he's going to get caught, which is interesting. Like one would think... 33 years have passed. Probably you're okay. It's startling that they're still looking for him, to be honest. And I have to wonder, because it, it's a, just as murder in Marburg unsolved 33 years later. And that they're still looking. Who was murdered? What are they still? To me, 33 years, that's a cold case. And the fact that this is not only something the police are still apparently working on, but that the newspaper is mentioning feels like some it had to be someone significant or the details surrounding the murder had to be really weird or something, because otherwise you would really just assume that this would have been dropped by now. You know, like I would have assumed if Alexander ever got caught, it would be somebody ran into him and recognized him somehow and put together 
his arrival to Winden and then began to like, you know, fill in the blanks. But instead, it's like newspapers that are still circulating this. And I was just really surprised. And he says to Waller, I want you to look into something if you can, confidentially. Is Waller the guy with the eye patch that is in the police? I felt like when he says Waller's name, we're supposed to know who that is. And I am just afraid to look anything up. Um, so I think that's who he, he is supposed to be talking to here, but not sure. Um, so then we go to the evening of the party and everybody, you know, hanging out in this house. Anniversary parties are always such an interesting thing to me because I understand wanting to celebrate that time together for sure. Um, it's just, and, and, you know, as an adult as well, there's always an, an enjoyment to, uh, getting an excuse to throw a party because when you're younger, you just have so much more time to do that. And when you get older, that's going to be harder and harder to do. The parties you throw are going to be on behalf of your kids a lot of the time or for holidays and stuff that feel kind of like an obligation. And, but it's always to me, like anniversary stuff has always felt private, something that you don't really celebrate with friends. And I don't know why I feel that way because you have a wedding with all of your friends there and everything. And this is just kind of doing that again, you know, to mark that day. Um, but when you get here, there's like so many more people here than I really expected. This is a town wide party, right? Um, and I should mention, everybody knows that Jonas and Marta have this thing. Everybody like there's actually a really cute moment. Jonas is on the road and it's Jonas from the time that we know in his yellow rain slicker. And they like his, uh, Ulrich and Katharina are about to drive, um, to Hannah's house and they see him and pull over to be like, Hey, I thought you were going to the lake. What's going on, man. And he acts really weird. I kind of thought that they would be like, is everything okay? But Ulrich just says something about how, Good, like, oh, somebody will be very happy to see you at the party tonight. And it's not going to be Magnus. And then later on at the end of the conversation says, all right, go get on with it, Romeo. And I liked that a lot because it's such a fucking cliche to have like fathers being incredibly protective of their daughters and being like, you know, defending their virtue in this way that feels really like possessive in a in a kind of gross, almost incestuous way. And I rather liked the fact that Ulrich is so like encouraging of this and so teasing and lighthearted about it. And it's just like, yeah, my daughter's super into you. And I, and it's almost like he sees Jonas as such a, a pure of heart kind of kid that he doesn't seem to feel the need to worry about Jonas. You know, I'm not sure if he would have reacted this way to Bartos, but whatever. Um, so this party, like Hannah is, uh, you know, coming down to greet him and they all sort of like go their own ways. And eventually the two of them go up to her bedroom. This is one of those moments because they start to have sex. I'm assuming they're about to have sex and they're not just making out because they're getting fully undressed. And all I could think was there's a party downstairs. Your parents are in the house. Like, I my parents would never have allowed me to have a boy in my room with the door closed anyway. But I guess they're depending on their parents being distracted and drunk downstairs and not coming up and noticing. I would be like so sure my parents would notice I was missing and then notice that the dude was also missing and be like they're upstairs together and come and find me. Apparently neither of them is concerned about that. Um but I just was like constantly on edge as they start making out because I was just like, somebody's about to come in, somebody's about to come in. But that is not actually how it goes. Um, so then we have, you know, um, Mikhail coming down, telling his mom, can you come up and hang out with me? I can't fall asleep. And she gets distracted. We have Ulrich and uh, Hannah in the backyard. And then we cut to Jonas that we know talking to her father, talking to his father and telling him, I know who you actually are. And it's a really touching moment because he 
his father is just at first like spooked because Jonas doesn't come out and say it right away. He first does the like um, ultimate fist bump and his father clearly remembers that moment, but doesn't know how, like what Jonas is saying. And he of course assumes, well, he's not saying I'm a time traveler because that's crazy. Nobody would believe that. But then the next thing Jonas says is like, no, I do know. And that moment of relief, like, I can't imagine having that kind of secret that not only you can't tell anybody just like, there's so many layers to that secret, but you know that you will probably have to take it to your grave, that nobody will ever believe you. And finally having somebody who you don't even have to convince, they come at you knowing the thing already. I feel like that has to be such a relief. Anyway, he winds up uh, begging his father to not kill himself. And there's a real puzzlement to his father's reaction, which I was like, okay, clearly this was not on his mind. He's not behaving like, oh, I was thinking about committing suicide. I can't believe that you know that. This is crazy. He's looking at him like, kill myself. Why would I? What? And I immediately was like, no, oh, no. And then Jonas takes the note out of his pocket. And that sealed it for me. I was like, that's it. He showed him the note. He's making this fucking thing happen, isn't he? Oh, this is so gross. I hate this. Don't know how this works. What is going on here? But I assume, you know, that that this is what's leading me here. And that's when he tells Jonas, you were the one who came and got me. So we see a flashback and we see out in the trees, a Jonas with the rain slicker on watching the entire scene and present Jonas grabs Mikkel's hand and runs. And another Jonas is out in the trees. Present Jonas trips and falls because he's not looking where he's going. Mikkel says, I lost you. And when I turned around, you were gone, but then suddenly you were there again and you said to come with you um, and to and that there was something evil out there far off and that we had to get away from it. And we went into the cave. I was really, really scared. Um, and we went through this friggin tunnel and you held my hand the whole time, even though I was really scared. And you said we had to stay there all night, but everything would be all right in the morning. And in the morning, I woke up and you were gone. And all these years, I've tried to understand why you would do that. But after a while, it started to fade away. And I have to say his acting here as he tells this story is impeccable. When he says all these years, I've tried to understand why you would do that. He looks like a little boy in the face. He looks like a hurt, frightened child. That's just like, I thought you were my friend and I didn't understand why you do that to me. And it's just this like awful fucking gut punch of just like this kid was lied to and abandoned somewhere. It wasn't even like he just that somebody like, you know, was preying on him. It, it, it wasn't just, I'm going to take you through and, and you're going to realize that it's the past and I'm going to like disappear somehow into the ether and leave you. He was tr tricked by someone he thought was his friend that he thought he knew and then told to stay and then left in the middle of like, there's something so much worse about this story than the way I imagined it went. And I said something like at the time about if somebody was right there and grabbed Mikkel and ran off, why would Mikkel go with them? Because he's out here with Jonas, you would think that he would have been like, he would have said something that would have gotten Jonas's attention. There's such a brief span of time where he is by himself. But it makes sense now. 
he thought this was Jonas that he had just been running with. He wouldn't have shouted. He wouldn't have said anything. He would have just assumed we got separated for a second and you're back. It's just, you know, it's all starting to fit together. And jo- you can see Jonas just being like, this doesn't make any sense. I, that can't be right. And he's starting to realize he got fucking played. And his dad can tell already and is saying, maybe you didn't come back to stop me, but to show me what it is I have to do. Maybe you only show me the letter so I'm aware what's in it and I can go and you live on. And Jonas is like, that is not it. Oh, my God, no. And he starts crying and says, Adam told me I could prevent this from starting. If you don't kill yourself, none of this will happen. Um, And his father's like, and you won't be born. And maybe your role is all is like a lot bigger than you think. And I'm just a tiny section of a huge tumor that is much bigger than any of us can imagine. And you can see Jonas get shook when he uses that wording and he realizes this conversation had to have happened because that exact wording was something that I said. So yeah, I'm not changing anything. This had to have happened. And then in walks fucking Claudia. And I was just ready to throw my fucking remote at the TV. What she knows all of this Ah, uh, what is happening? And she says she's waited for this moment for a very long time. Jonas, of course, does not yet know who she is. He thinks she's with Adam and she's like, no, no, no. Adam is the darkness. I don't follow him. I follow the light. He lied to you. He led you back here to ensure it all happens exactly as it always has. And I really like this was the one part of the episode that I found really frustrating. Jonas says, that's not right. Adam sent me back because he wants to stop this. She says, no, he does not. He doesn't want to fix things. He wants to destroy them forever. And your role is bigger than you think. And she says, you alone can finally stop all this but you have to fight yourself. And Adam, or not Adam, Jonas says, well, wouldn't it just be easier if I never existed though? I mean, if I take myself out of the equation, if Adam's the bad guy, how about I just don't exist? And that would probably solve the problem. And she says, I have seen the world without you. It's not what you think. It's not what you're expecting. Guys, if somebody said that to you, wouldn't you immediately be like, what do you mean? What's it like? I don't even have an expectation. What, how did you see it? How, wait, are there alternate timelines? What do you mean you've seen it without me? How can that be if everything happens the same way every time? I would have asked, seven different things in it, in the, the instant she said that to me. Jonas just starts crying and doesn't say anything. And I'm like, dude, how is this not spawning like ton, tons of questions on your part? Oh, this kill. This is so frustrating. He's just basically she that's all she says is like, it's not what you're expecting. This isn't just about the two of you. All of us have to make sacrifices. She doesn't even really give an explanation. And all of a sudden, Mikkel's like, I guess I have to kill myself. And I was like, what? How? 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 How do we know we can trust this woman she, who just walked into your kitchen whom you don't know? How does her saying I've seen the world without you in it not make you go, wait, how though? And why do you accept her assertion here to the point that somebody is literally willing to take their own lives for it? I don't get it. I don't get it. It just feels so thin to me. Um, But obviously he does wind up, you know, deciding that this sacrifice is worth it for some reason. 
So we get kind of a uh, montage after this of um, first we have the Ulrich and Hannah scene. Then we go to Peter, who is uh, visiting the sex worker in the uh, trailer, whose name I'm forgetting. And we see that his daughter, Francesca, is watching and is aware of what's going on. And things are really strained between him and Charlotte. Charlotte knows he's having an affair and he's like not even quite lying about it. It's just that she's suspicious of him every time he's not in the house and he has to try and convince her he wasn't where she thinks, but he's not trying to convince her that he isn't cheating. You know, at one point he says, maybe that's why things are the way they are because you don't give me anything. And that to me is him being like, yeah, maybe this is why I cheat. That's him admitting it. Right. But it's just such a weird thing. Um, then we see the uh, the dinner with Bartas and his parents, which okay, no, it's not a it's not a business thing. It's just them three having champagne together. Um, I don't remember what the dinner is in celebration of, but obviously Bartas is having a fucking miserable time. And we see Jonas and Marta in her room, and then we cut to Adam, and as we cut to his face. The uh, voiceover is saying we make a lie in our truth in order to survive is the uh, I think the lyrics of the song. We try to forget until we can't anymore. We don't even know half of the mysteries of this world. Oh, maybe this isn't a song. Maybe this is Claudia talking. Um, and he is looking at the spot where Jonas just stepped into and went back in time. And at this point, two other people walk into the room and there's a man who says you could have told him what his function is in all this, what journey you've really sent him on. And Adam says not long before the last cycle and begins to leave. And the woman turns to him and says, Magnus, we all have to make sacrifices. And I'm like, word, is that Marta? Is that somebody else? Is that Francesca? Magnus? How? What? I I sat there. I was just like, what's going on? Magnus is on the side of darkness, too, if we're to believe Claudia. And I do believe Claudia. I don't really have a good reason for that beyond the fact that Magnus is like a super rich white dude with like a fucking doomsday device in his house. He feels like a supervillain. You know, Claudia is the scrappy rebel out here living in the woods with her backpack. Like, I just believe her more. I just do. That's all it is. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. I've been wrong about a lot. I'm just saying. So I'm going to wrap this up. I'm delighted that this did not cut out in the middle. Thank you very much to Nikolai for commissioning this. My apologies for having to reschedule it so abruptly. I hope that you were able to watch or listen that it's okay. Thank you everybody else for hanging out. Um, and I will be doing Gravity Falls and uh, Clarial later on this today. So stay tuned for those. <sighs> Thank you all so much for your patience. Appreciate you. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.
was an unspoiled network podcast. <laughs>